so welcome to everyone and uh, you will have noticed probably that your microphones are all muted um, I've kept everyone's microphones muted for now for the sake of uh, the recording um, and if you could also keep your uh, video off for now as well um, at the end of the talk when we get to the questions if you want to put questions either in the chat or if you raise your hand, not physically raise your hand, but there is a little raise your hand button and then I can uh, unmute you so that then we can have a bit of a conversation afterwards. It's, uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here uh, and discussing such an important uh, matter uh, of environment which uh, crisscrosses between faith and science and also see in, and also development of uh, change uh, in, in, in various communities. So my <clears throat> slide which I'm showing just now, the first one is just indicating that I'm going to look at uh, an environment through the prism of faith. The prism is very interesting because it reflects and refracts light. So you're seeing uh, reflection and refraction. And I would like to give some insider uh, insights into the process of changing environmental practices in faith communities. So, um, I now... go to the next slide. In this slide, I put up this slide specifically because I think that uh, really, really, you know, kind of indicates uh, what uh, different perceptions would be about the nature, about environment. And I think it's very interesting. I just love this bird, you know, in my garden. And, 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 I, and I got this off the internet, of course. Uh, but I thought that's really interesting. You know, what does bird see when it sees, views, and contemplates nature? And what do we see when we view, see, and nature? When you see the garden, the places around us, the greenery, the, the, the jungle of you no know, buildings, etc., in the in the urban areas, in the fields and the trees and the gardens in the rural areas. So what do we really see? So just to get you into the mode of thinking about perspectives, different perspectives. Okay, um, I would like to start off first by saying that. Uh, my background, my professional background is that of a lawyer. Um, I've been doing legal consultancy work in, in oil and gas industry, mainly on the regulation side. And I worked in, on many projects in many developing countries, um, about 30 developing countries or so, in helping to formulate policy and legislation and negotiating projects, oil and gas and mining projects. So I have uh, that particular perspective of environmental concerns that I have come across in the oil and gas and the mining industry. So that's one perspective. My interest in environment, uh, you know, has arisen from my professional work, which involved addressing specific environmental problems, issues, things about mitigation, reduction of the you know, minimization of the impact of natural resource development on people's lives, on people who are living around there, on the environment, on, on, the, on the various sceneries that are around there, and how the various places where the projects are being developed uh, is, is, is affecting, impacting on the, the areas in the, you know, in this, in these places and the people who live around there. So that's one. It, that's how I started my interest in environment as I was doing my professional work. I found that it's very interesting, um, specifically because I visited mines, I visited places where you know, oil and gas uh, work was being done, and I, and I could see um, the impact that it would have on various people who are around. You know, a pipeline running near your house is not what you want, whether it's oil or gas pipeline, you know, a big transmission pipeline, you don't want that near your house. So no one wants that. And you don't want certainly a well being drilled next to your house. So 
people's concerns, they have their normal ways of leading their lives, their farming activities, their agriculture activities, etc., their villages. Um, so, you know, that is a kind of perspective that one has. As uh, when I was negotiating a particular contract, uh, a gold mining contract in one of the island countries in the in the in, in one of the places here in one of the islands, I was quite uh, struck by the 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 government official who was leading, who was there to to on the negotiating table on behalf of the government, putting something on the board saying that when all the fish has died, all the water has gone, all the seas have been contaminated then are we going to eat this gold that we are working on in this project? And I think it was, you know, quite, quite, uh, it had an impact on people. Certainly it had an impact on the oil company, the, the mining company that was uh, there to negotiate a, a, a contract with the government. So it had an impact. My interest in uh, the theological aspects, uh, Islamic theological aspects uh, on environment began with uh, my work. Uh, I was involved with uh, a, a committee uh, of religious leaders, priests and scholars representing the three major uh, faiths, Christianity, Judaism and Islam. And this was uh, being done uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a project. Uh, uh, you know, which was Faith and Creation Project uh, at the Heathrow uh, uh, Institute for Religion, Ethics and Public Life in the University of London. So this was over two years that I was involved in that. So it's quite interesting to see how we could, you know, explore, discuss and share the various faith perspectives on environmental issues and concerns that we will, you know, we could that the people clearly have, and by by sharing the traditions and the belief systems, and to see exactly how could we actually think of the way in which this could possibly provide solutions. But that's one aspect that, and I worked on that, and uh, my actual um, doctorate research is on environment and Islam, which began at the Islamic College. Uh, and I am now at the moment uh, in my final years, finishing up my thesis on changing environmental practices in uh, Koja Shia faith communities, selected communities, which to which I belong. And, 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 and therefore I'm an insider, as well as um, uh, being an outsider researcher uh, and, and in, in the UK. So this is what I'm doing at Middlesex University at the moment. I'd like to start off now uh, with a few questions, just to make us think. Uh, you know, we need to uh, try to reflect as to what we, what is our relationship with environment? Uh, what kind of relationship? How do we regard the environment? That what do we mean by environment when you say? You know, when we look at uh, the land, the forests, the Amazon forest, the way it's been, it's being developed for clearly commercial purposes by being burnt, you know, by being uh, deforested and burnt at, at the moment. So you get, uh, you get uh, an idea. So when you say environment, you think of the rivers, you think of the mountains, you think of the land, you think of greenery, you think of gardens flowing water, you think of things that really are very pleasing to the eyes and they matter a lot. So when you, when you look at the environment and you say, okay, what is my relationship? What is the nature of my relationship with environment? How do I see? Do I see it as something to work on, develop, uh, maybe utilize and, you know, uh, over exploit or you exploit for my purposes. So do I look at environment from an intrinsic value point of view, or do I look at it from the point of view of uh, instrumental value? So intrinsic value is the inherent value that you regard. So, you know, when you look at a river and you just ask yourself, what kind of intrinsic value, you know, you put on that God's creation, you know, a river, 
a beautiful river, you know, which, you know, sprouts so many different types of communities and activities, etc. As opposed to the instrumental value, when you say, okay, I want to utilize this huge river uh, and maybe make a dam project, uh, flood uh, areas out, produce electricity, produce, uh, you know, something that will help in industrial development, etc. So, you know, it's a kind of intrinsic and uh, inherent value. So I think you have to ask yourself, you can look outside your garden and say, okay, what kind of relationship you have with your garden, for example. I know that in my community at the moment, uh, we are thinking of um, a project to use our gardens for space for purposes of growing food. So for purposes of growing vegetables, you know, lettuce, carrots, tomatoes, potatoes, and actually utilizing the empty space that you have uh, in your garden space, your back your, your backyard garden, and maybe even you know for in, in, you know in house gardening or in house growing of plants, etc. You could be using uh, you know you could be you could be growing some of the things even inside your kitchen. So the thing is, uh, the project that we are thinking of at the moment is uh, interesting people to do gardening, but there's something inherently beautiful about uh, working with nature, touching the soil, you know, working with your hands, you know, and developing your gardens, growing things. And also the idea is to use the produce for yourselves so you can use it. You just take it when you want it. You don't have to buy too much. And it goes rot, rotten, no. You actually use what you want. Then if you've got extra, you give it out to food banks in the community and the society at large. So these are the kind of, you know, views, perspectives you can have about things that you do, with, you can do with the nature. Um, the other important question to consider is, what kind of relationship will I say I have with the environment around me? Is it like I am the subject and it is the object? So I can do, I, it, it is for me. So all this environment has been created by God for me, for human beings. And I can do whatever I like with it. I can use it. It's uh, something that uh, I dominate over. Then I will actually do things what I want on it and what I, the, the way I will deal with it. Uh, is there a subject-object uh, relationship so I can regard it as my own property my own um, within my jurisdiction and uh, I can do whatever I like with it or do I regard it as um, a creation by God which is similar which is on the same level plane as my as myself so I'm a creation of God and whatever else is there is the creation of God the mountains the air the atmosphere etc and and how do I have this relationship with it do I regard it as subject, object, or subject, subject, in which we are at, at par with each other? So I think that are the few key questions that um, I wanted to start off with before I go to the next slide. And here I want to look at uh, some very, very uh, underlying principles of uh, uh, Islamic principle of philosophy of natural order and creation. So what are the underpinning principles, you know? So the first principle is really that the, this, if you regard us, all of us, as creation for a purpose by, a cre by the creator, God, and we are serving a certain purpose in our lives since we are going to come to the end of this life, and, and we, must, we must have a purpose. We must have some purpose which God intended for us. So that's, that's the first principle. The second principle is that everything, you see, God is the ab absolute creator of all creation. So the centrality of God and oneness of God, which permeates into everything, which is, which is reflected by creation, all the creation. The second principle that I would like to is, is the principle of responsibility. So if we have been given um, 
powers of intellect, powers to utilize, uh, to be able to do things to the rest of creation, then are we able to just do whatever we want, wantonly, or is there some kind of responsibility we have towards God? Because this is, this is a creation of God, this is uh, the sign of God, this is manifestation of God. So do I have a responsibility as a human being who has been born in this world, has been created by God? Do I have a responsibility to my rest of the creation? Then uh, we have this principle of harmony, balance, and natural order in creation, which is that everything has been created with a very, very specific harmony and balance, which enables the whole of creation, the universe, to function. So all these physical laws of light, of velocity, of uh, you know, which, which you know in physics, are all reflecting balance, harmony, and natural order which we utilize for the purposes of being able to have uh, scientific development, et cetera, gravity, et cetera, all that. This, the, the, the other principle is that we have, the, we have been given by God the permission to utilize this environment. You can grow things, you can use your garden, you can farm, you can eat of the produce, you can enjoy the rivers and the mountains, etc. You know, you can enjoy life in, a, in the environment at large, but not to waste it and not to abuse it. So we have this permission to utilize, but not to waste. So the concept of moderate utilization and the concept that, look, otherwise you will be doing injustice. And that concept of injustice is a very wide concept. If you do something, you know, it is also it is also something that you can look at. So if you're, for example, you know, one example is you are near a river and, and, and you know that uh, the river is, is flowing with water. And one of the Islamic narrations says that if I want to use that water, I should certainly be able to use it. I can wash, I can drink. But if I want to waste it, no. I can't waste it. So, you know, for, you know, you, we can't actually utilize it wantonly just at our whim. So that's, that's the idea of injustice. So, and the relationship, which is a harmonious relationship between man and nature, which I alluded to in the key questions. One other thing is that if we regard creation, uh, environment as part of creation and we are developing this attitude of thankfulness and being grateful to God for God's bounties, then we certainly have to respect environment. And, and we, we need to be able to see that, look, these are things that bring us closer to God's pleasure, to God's will. And, 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 and of course, since we have this concept of um, hereafter, that there is a responsibility of man to, cre to, to creation. That is, that is, so, you know, in, in one of the discussions that we had, we discussed uh, whether man is uh, an owner of this world or is he a tenant or is he a traveler or is he a pilgrim who is passing through the world and he is utilizing the bounties, but he then he has to give back the keys of this, in, in which he's living, the in of the world, to someone else, because there is something intergenerational. There are others who are going to come back, who are going to come after me, after us all, and they are going to utilize. So we have to think in terms of intergenerational uh, equity. And so this is um, one, 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 one further principle. The earth is regarded as particularly sacred, it's a special status to it. You know, there is, um, we actually believe, one of the principles is um, that when we want to worship God, we post prostrate on, um, we do a prostration on the earth. When we, when people die, we give them back to the earth. The earth has got a very, very special relationship with us. 
And um, there's, of course, the therapeutic effect of greenery, running water, plants, vegetation, gardens, flowers, trees, and fruits. And that water is a gift from God and is a source of life on earth for everyone. And of course, this is a gift to humanity. And then we have this principle of being kind to animals. So I will, I did, uh, I have talked about the, the other relationships. So now I'm going to go to my project and say, okay, what did I try to do in this project? The purpose was to contribute to changing environmental practices in the faith communities. So there were six faith communities I worked in with, and uh, the basic idea was uh, to, to bring about change in the environmental practices. And I did this through utilizing uh, uh, as uh, change agents, um, discussion groups that were drawn from these faith communities and to work with them to see what are the issues, what are the problems that, what are the problematic practices and how we can actually, what can we do to, to improve? And what, how will we bring about this whole social process of change in our community? So that was basically my project. Um, we did a lot of aware, awareness building um, between uh, the community practices and the current environmental concerns of global warming, et cetera, and uh, you know, climate change. Um, one thing which came out very in, which is quite very interesting is that, you know, being faith communities, we had this espoused beliefs. So everyone accepted that these are the beliefs of our faith, which I've just been talking about in the previous uh, previous 10 minutes all the underlying principles. So they are actually the espoused beliefs. And then we have to see, okay, the discussion then is how, what are the implications of these beliefs in terms of the current community practices? So for example, if I'm going to use styrofoam and plastic for all the food events that take place, and we have so many food events that take place in our communities, not at the moment because of COVID, but after COVID, normally in one year, we have got about 100 to 150 plus food events that take place in our community at the center. So if I'm going to use styrofoam and I'm going to use plastic in the community, what is what am I really doing? Am I, uh, are my espoused principles, beliefs, uh, uh, you know, finding some kind of transformation into actual practice? Or, or, are my, or there is a, a deep kind of a, a gap between the practice and the beliefs. So we looked at that and uh, also what were the motivational factors for change? So, you know, what were the kind of, what, what would make people change their practices? And of course, um, issues, we, we have many barriers of change to change that came across, we came across. So for example, it was a bit, quite a bit like a wicked problem because when you thought of a solution to a problem, to the problem, then another problem emerged. And then you had to address the other problems. So for example, when it came to styrofoam and plastics, we said, okay, let us try to get uh, uh, biodegradable material, which is more expensive. And let's try to use that. Uh, and we found therefore, and then we find that uh, uh, this, uh, biodegradable cutlery is not actually being composted by the local authorities. They are burnt. They are being burnt like everything else. Then the people ask then, what is the purpose of using biodegradable material that cannot be composted? You know, that is not being composted. So we have a basic problem. So there's a second problem that arises. We are still creating waste. And that waste is uh, a little bit better than the plastic and the styrofoam, but it is it doesn't. Uh, it still takes time to biodegrade in the in the in the in the dumps, etc. And it will end up somewhere in the oceans also. So we have this. Um, we, we we were looking at uh, how to deal with. Uh, so of course uh, the next item, the next way of looking is: you know, shall we get a dishwasher, an industrial dishwasher that is going to be, and you use proper porcelain and you know proper cutlery 
and then we reuse it. So the whole idea about reusing, you know, this idea of circular economy, you reuse and, you know, you actually, you don't waste it, you reuse it and uh, it helps uh, in actually identifying, you know, dealing with the problem. So um, I, the last two points that I want to make uh, on this is that uh, there was this question of whether are we going to be moved by faith alone or are we going to be moved by science? So what is the role of faith in this change process? What is the role of science? And, and, and the issue about science, the technology, that, et cetera, you know, the information, the studies, the knowledge that is generated through science is certainly very, very important. And we had, uh, it was very important in this process of uh, contributing to change to see so many things appearing in the social media and search in geographical, you know, kind of movies and clips about how the oceans are being uh, congested because of plastic, etc. So, you know, we, it was very helpful to see all the scientific studies. And then we have the role of faith. So how do we use both in order to motivate the change? And the one thing more which I, I found very interesting was there were the gender factor in the community and the role of women as change drivers. Um, it is very interesting to see how women, how mothers, how children, they took to you know all the 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 green initiatives much more readily than the men. So, for example, if we had a, an initiative which said you bring your own cutlery, reusable cutlery from home, and then you go in, you take it back and then you wash it at home. We found that the men found that very inconvenient, A, to remember to bring it to the congregation at the food events, and also to take it back and wash it at home. So they ended up not bringing it, even though we sold reusable cutlery at a concession price to the congregation, they, they bought it all, but they never brought it. So the men were really, really, not adaptable to this particular kind of initiative. But the women, they brought their bags, they brought the cutlery, the children brought their own cutlery, they bought cutlery for the children as well. And we find that the mothers, the you know, and the women and the volunteers who are who were among the women, the women who were there among the volunteers is absolutely uh, showed a very positive attitude to change, to wanting to change and to actually helping with the change process. So I want to end up now with two pictures that uh, I want to show just to indicate, starting from the bird, now you look at the, the horizon, look at the skies, look at the sunlight, you look at the land. Um, it's amazing, you know, it gives you something. What does it make you feel? And look here, look at the sea, and you have a, a sailing yacht, very environmental friendly, I guess, because it's using wind power. And, you know, being there in the wide ocean, what does it make you feel? So I want to end up with this. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll be very grateful for any discussion and any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps you'd like to um, stop sharing the slides so we can see your and put your camera back on so that we can see your face again. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I find that fascinating, the, the kind of the, the psychology, the social psychology of how you change practices uh, within a group. And I think something potentially relevant for us as well as a, as a college uh, community, thinking about what, what it is that motivates and, and what are some of um, the barriers to change. I mean, did you did you find that there was any sort of because uh, I don't know whether this was something that that they brought you in to do this with them or or you kind of approached them? Uh, how did that how did that happen and okay. that you got involved? So when I developed my proposal, it was to enhance environmental practices in faith communities, and I decided in choosing the faith communities. Uh, amongst a, a cultural social group of communities to which I belong. Mm -hmm. uh, they are from East Africa. They have uh, 
develop their own community structures, which is based on election, constitution. Mm. There are a lot of internal dynamics uh, of relationship between members and the leadership. And one very interesting feature of these communities is that uh, there is um, uh, a, a volunteering corp, which mm. uh, the community develops the spirit of volunteering. And therefore, a lot of, uh, there's a group of people, a very large group of people who are actually volunteers. They help in serving food. Mm -hmm. And this serving food is sacred food. So it's kind of making community bond together mm -hmm. on a religious function, on a religious event, where you share the sacred food after the event. Mm -hmm. So you have the sermon and everything. So I, I decided myself to choose uh, according to my criteria, you know, this community uh, in UK, in the five, six communities, and uh, essentially I set up discussion groups in each one of them. So I used every avenue which is available to me, namely my contacts, uh, my approaches to the community leaders, uh, my approaches to people who I know might be able to help in the recruitment of discussion group members, etc. So I used all that and we developed this, we actually set up, established the discussion groups in each of the six communities. And what is interesting is that now that my project, uh, my fieldwork ended in December 2019, essentially, uh, I found that these groups are still continuing. Mm -hmm. They are still carrying on. They are really playing the role as, you know, kind of change agents. Uh, and and this is now, you know, this has been affected, impacted by COVID-19 restrictions. So clearly we don't have anything happening in the mosque. But just to give you an example of the volunteering spirit, we still had on one of one very big religious day, we had an initiative by the volunteers to serve food and deliver food at home. So this is like mm -hmm. sacred food. Mm -hmm. that you'd have otherwise have got in the mosque was being given mm -hmm. through a network of volunteers in each area who came and delivered this at your doorstep. Mm -hmm. and I thought that was absolutely magnificent mm -hmm. and very inspirational to see this kind of volunteering spirit. Mm -hmm. And essentially, so having established the discussion groups, have had face-to-face -face meetings with them, the other thing that I did uh, was to set up WhatsApp groups because um, it is not possible to always have face-to-face -face meetings with all the groups. And uh, some of the groups you can have more than one, two, but people have time constraints. So I essentially uh, said, okay, let us have a continue our discussions on WhatsApp groups. So you can just jot down your points. Mm. We just say something that you want to say day or night. You can, you can contribute to the discussion. And so part of, a very important part of my data is my, my WhatsApp uh, oh. chat. So, I mean, it, it strikes me that there's a, a huge sort of social capital there already, if you like, that these groups already have, um, you know, this sense of community and this cooperation. Um, oh, actually, there's just, there's also a message. Well, I will just ask this question and then I will ask somebody sure. else's question because I've just seen it to arrive. Um, that, um, to what extent do you think this ability to, to sort of change their practices and to be inspired to change comes from faith? And to what extent do you think like any community that was had that social capital and had that strength of community culturally or whatever um, could in a sense be um, I don't want to say used in this way, but like could have that kind of impact in that same way. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. Thing is, uh, <clears throat> looking at uh, the way in which the social change, the the the, the change process took place. Um, clearly, there was a lot of resistance. Clearly, there was a lot of obstacles. People needed to be made publicly aware. So a lot of public awareness people needed to be made aware that, look, what are the faith teachings in our own faith? And how they actually, what they do, do they mean in practical terms? 
you know, in, in terms of what we are really doing um, here. Um, so, uh, you know, faith, uh, my initial starting point was, and I, I thought this to myself, that look, if I make everyone aware that these are the faith teachings and faith obligations and faith responsibilities that you have, people will change. It didn't happen that way. <laughs> There's a lot of gap between espouse principles, faiths, and you know your practice beliefs. So, it is not to say that uh, these people are not actually good believers. No, we all are good believers, but we all encounter wicked problems in our lives to make change, and we, we find one problem in the other, and we try to find. A, so I also discovered that when I was attending a, a Jewish uh, Green uh, uh, meeting in my area, that uh, they were trying to uh, say that, look, uh, we want to uh, preserve energy and use best use of energy in homes. So they were actually looking at it from the angle that how can you make it worth their while financially? Mm. So you see, this is the idea. If you take pure faith and pure altruism, that you're prepared to sacrifice something for faith, that you'll give up something for pure faith, and you're, you'll change your lifestyle, current lifestyle for pure faith, it is something that doesn't occur very easily. Mm -hmm. People find difficulty. And there's a lot of self-justification. We can't really do it. We live in a world of corporatism. We live in a world of multinationals. We live in a world of... Uh, exploitation, etc. What do we do? What will this count for it, etc. And you know, but the idea is everything, every small thing should help me. So you need to have an actually an attitude of mind. Your pers your mindset needs to be that if I'm going to wash, uh, as I do in the kitchen, uh, the the utensils, the cutlery, I'll not waste. I will not put it on throughout, and just because there's a lot of water coming from the taps and I will just keep on washing and I will maybe just keep it on until I finish the whole thing. So I won't be conscious of how much water I'm wasting. But if I have the mindset that I don't want to waste water, although it's in abundance, and think about all these poor people who have to travel miles carrying those huge buckets and things to get water, you know, and, and we had the phenomena in Texas of water not being there. And we previously, years ago in Cape Town, of no water being there. And you know how people are actually going out in the streets and, you know, getting water from whatever source the government was providing for them because there was no water in the pipes. So it's a mindset. So it, it's like what is the best outcome is to make small baby steps, incremental changes, but to have a mindset. So if I am, if I have a plastic bottle, which I don't normally have, but someone gives me water bottle, plastic bottle, then I should feel that, look, I'm not going to throw this. I'm not going to throw this. I'm going to use it as much as I can. I, after use, utilizing it as much as I can, at some point in time, I'll try to recycle it. So, you know, this circular economy thing, I should I be thinking all the time. I don't want to see waste. I don't want it wasted. Uh, so I think faith in itself uh, can start you off thinking about mm. your mindset, thinking mm. about contemplation and reflection of what you are really doing. But to then turn around totally, you know, you need something else. So you need the question of whether it's harming you. If I have, if I use plenty of water and my tank goes dry, it's harm to me, right? Now, that is the factor that's going to in, you know, impact on my, my, myself to tell me, look, I shouldn't be you know, wasting water because I'm going to waste it. I won't get any more water. I'll have to go out again or get water from some other source. So that harm to myself or gain, harm, profit or harm. So it's all these factors that come into it. And then human mind always seeks a way of easy way out, right? So we then thought, let's have an industrial dishwasher. That is the global solution. We won't use plastic or styrofoam. And you know, if we get, and I'm sure now when we do get a, a good 
uh, industrial, good size industrial dishwasher, the whole community is going to heave a sign of sigh of relief that look, we don't need to now get into bringing our own cutlery <laughs> or not get to thinking about this or that. So I think, uh, but uh, I, I, I think this needs to be explored. Can faith really in itself motivate mm. you to change your lifestyle quite remark, quite transform it quite remarkably? And I used to see these pictures, you know, The Good Life, which was a series, mm. TV series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And next to it was this mention of all the gadgets, or the neighbor having all the gadgets, you know. So, you know, it's, it's like, that. are we able to, to do that? To what extent we can actually utilize faith? So you've got to be, you have to understand that we can utilize faith as a starting point, but at some point we are going to see exactly how can we make it, easy, how can you facilitate mm -hmm. us from making, you know, in making the change. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of questions appearing over here. Um, I like the follow through approach. If biodegradable cutlery goes to the incinerator, as plastic would have done, there's no green gain. So use re reusable, bring from home rather than washing after the event. We all need to think things through, improve, for example, the process by the authorities and change the culture so people don't expect cutlery to be provided. Yeah, so it's kind of broadening it out to that more systemic questions of both our expectations and I mean it's it's like you're saying that we we think oh it's we, we couldn't possibly save water but then actually if we were in a situation where there was a limited amount and the government just gave us a limited amount because that's what there was actually you know there would be the pressure to change systems and there would also be the you know the change of our own expectations yeah so you know I was toying around with these two approaches the bottom up and the top down. Mm -hmm. The bottom up is where you develop a consensus uh, with people, give them all good reasons and re rationalized uh, justifications for making the change, for the need of change. But then you actually ask yourself, uh, now, um, you know, is this all, is, is this by itself going to work? Uh, so you say, okay, should there be some pressure from the top down approach? Should be there some regulation? Should mm. we regulate this producers of this styrofoam and plastic products that they bear responsibility? They bear responsibility to society since they make profits out of this, selling these items. Are they going to provide for the ways in which these have to be, you know, kind of disposed of in an eco friendly manner? And uh, why put the burden on the local authorities, which is government? Why put the burden on everyone in the whole society when you have made? So you see the corporate sector also mm. in the market has to, to think in terms of where, uh, you know, it can provide the necessary impetus to make the change. So, you know, for example, if you look at, um, uh, you know, this good corporate governance, which became, which is now in place, but which was not there before in the mm. corporate sector where people paid themselves exactly what they wanted to do, where they did exactly, there was hardly any shareholder, you know, you know, remedy, et cetera, and all that. This did not come about, uh, you know, voluntarily. Mm. It came about because of pressure from the government, either through reports or through, you know, legislation. So, you know, I think we need to think in terms of uh, environmental practices uh, developing good environmental practices being embedded in a in a policy structure, which says that look, we will going to we're going to be zero carbon by this year. We're not going to use styrofoam and plastic. We're going to we're going to allow to use that. We're going to go look for substitutes, and 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 at some point straws etc. and all those things will not be used. And we are we are really doing so because we want to preserve the environment for the next generation. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, so saying that actually even something can be made illegal, but then it actually doesn't stop people yes. throwing litter and everything else. Um, yeah, I totally agree. So, I, 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 I mean, when, when we are passing by some of these uh, fields, we find uh, people dumping, 
you know, uh, kind of surreptitiously, you know, just dumping stuff, you know, mattresses and that and that littering. I think uh, you, we both, we need both. We need an understanding. So that's why it, a bottom, uh, bottom up approach and a top down approach, both are necessary. People have to buy in into this whole idea of a mindset where you say, okay, we're doing this because we think this is the right thing to do. Mm. It is right for us, it's right for a future generation, it's right for the whole society. And it's right for our relationship with God and our relationship with the rest of creation. We have to develop that mindset. So that has to be worked on. So one of the things that I was trying to do in this research to see exactly how can we develop the mindset if we can't make you know, you know, very, very great changes uh, you know, in, 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 in practices, can we actually start people thinking, make make people change their mindset in such a way that they will look at things differently and they'll be more amenable to, mm. to accepting many other things that they would not otherwise have. Oh, that's interesting. So the question, like almost the other way around, did, could increase consciousness about environment cause more people to embrace faith as a means of valuing the earth? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting and a, and a very, I would say, a, a nice uh, out of the box kind of question. Very interesting. Yes, uh, I, I think that if you take, you know, the, the relationship of faith and creation, ourselves, is such that if we can, if we, if we were, say, at a stage or in a condition where we didn't have that much faith, or we were not committed to faith. But when we saw through seeing these kind of consciousness about the environment, which is a sign for us, which we can, which is manifested for us, we can see the damage, etc., what it will do, then you can go up and and start thinking about this. Why is this? Where is this coming from? And you know the whole question of ethics, which is based on faith and ethics which is not based on faith. So not based on any particular faith. But you know, you have these ethical values because one of the things that um, uh, Islam, one of the underlying principles is that God has given us uh, what is uh, fitra in nature. A nature that recognizes what is right and what is wrong. And you can get a route to faith through your fitra. So you can actually discover a faith. You can discover that you believe. You, you know, you will you will enter the belief system through this particular route. So yes, I, I think that clearly consciousness about the environment and climate change. If you see exactly all the drastic things that is happening to climate, to the glaciers, to all you know, you know, I was in Maldives, uh, which is a beautiful island yeah. on my work. You know, all work related. And <laughs> <laughs> I was doing projects there. And I used to go to the seashore because Maldives in Mali is the capital. And I used to live there, you know, in the hotel there. I used to find that they were all the time doing protection of the, the sea banks, you know, with huge, huge boulders because all this, um, uh, you know, the, the sea levels were rising. Uh, and clearly a point would come at when, when, you know, it would just disappear under the sea. So, you know, there was this, so we have this impact as well on, on, on so many things. So if you understand that livelihood, lives, so many refugees of climate change or global warming, and, and we all, our lives are so interconnected that if something happens there in Maldives or happens in uh, Kiribati, you know, in the Pacific Islands, it's going to affect us. It's affecting us. And, and you know, it's a question of uh, trying to understand that just because it's not affecting me right now, I'm safe. Mm. So I, didn't know, I don't need to worry. Mm. But that is the insular kind of uh, shallow, closed mentality that we are trying to get out of. We just say, okay, mm. let's go global. Let's think in terms of how we can understand nature and our role in nature better. Mm. Yeah, and I think there's maybe a generational shift with this that certainly compared with, say, when I was a student myself, seeing the students 
that I work with now the much greater awareness of environmental issues and therefore I think thinking more deeply about ethical questions and like how do we you know almost the sort of the meta questions like not just how do we how do we act but like how do we make decisions what is actually the the ethical framework of the values behind our behavior and I think definitely that well one one hopes that those of us from faith traditions kind of have some answers to at least where you might start answering and looking at those questions but I think part of it is maybe just that awareness uh, that sort of more global awareness of interconnectedness yeah. um, that that is just more possible now because of uh, I mean you know just the way we live now I don't actually know whether there's anybody on this call from across the world at the moment but just the fact that that that, that, that can be that that can be a possibility in a way that it never was before um, and therefore having to think about our own behavior in that wider context yeah i think uh, since uh, we, you know judaism christianity and islam all share mm. this belief that uh, manifestations of god is or not so you can actually look at the earth and see as manifestation of god creation you can actually it it can actually make you think as to what is your central purpose and given our very, very um, uh, market oriented lives mm. with uh, excessive uh, cons cons consumption and, and conspicuous consumption and, you know, competitive consumption, which does not give happiness to people. I personally feel that current lifestyles can, if one actually thinks and contemplates on our own lives and say, what is, what am I really doing? What's my purpose? I'm pursuing some illusion of happiness, but am I getting that happiness? And you find, mm -hmm. then the only thing that's left for you, which is the real path, way to spirituality, is faith. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we, when we see people in this world now, idolizing some people, or idolizing things, or the cultness, cult behavior, cult worship, what does cult worship indicate? There's some hollowness, something missing in people's lives. And, and, and this thing which is missing is because of the system, the, the current uh, lifestyle, you know, the framework within which they live. So essentially, if you had faith and you found the purpose of your life and you say, okay, this is the way for me, this kind of illuminates the, the way. So it is like a philosophical mm -hmm. thing. So sometimes, uh, you, you know, the fact that our lives don't look, they look very hollow. Uh, they do not seem to lead to anything. Mm -hmm. And I think COVID-19 may be making people reflect on where are we, yeah. where are we going to. So, you know, it's, it's a way of saying, okay, I, maybe there is something about faith which is inherent in me that I can discover. It's, it's interesting when you're saying about, you know, the, the, the different faith traditions and, and what they share. And because the, the automatic thing that I think of as a Christian, when you talk about like the system, like the way the world works, the way society um, and almost going back to some of what we were saying about, you know, you're trying to make changes, but you feel blocked because the, actually the system does not really facilitate making those changes in your lifestyle that as a Christian, I automatically think in terms of the, the idea of the world being fallen, that there is, you know, sin is not just something individual, it's actually something collective um, and something that we we sort of cannot help but be somewhat um, uh, complicit in almost just, just by our life. Um, but I was wondering from your experience of working with uh, Jewish and Christian groups as well as um, in, in Islam, whether you see what you see as being the similarities and the differences in is, is there much difference in terms of people's environmental attitudes or is it really other factors than faith that really determine different people's attitudes? Mm. Um, I have actually spoken on uh, environmental issues in a synagogue as well, quite apart from the Heathrow College uh, work that I did together mm. with the priests and the rabbi mm. that we were there. Um, I think that um, the first thing is really that we discovered was that um, we 
we all agreed that there were very, very immediate concerns about environment, about climate change, about global warming, about market, about the whole economy, about how it is going and where it is leading us that need some kind of um, consideration of what is within our faith traditions to actually see whether we can uh, think in terms of some solutions or some ways of thinking about us. So I found, for example, that uh, in the Judaic thing, we had this uh, like working on the land, mm -hmm. uh, like being responsible for land, working hard at it. So being very careful about land. So that was one element. The other one in, the, in the Christianity was stewardship, where you say, okay, we have to, and this whole idea of being tenants on this earth, and you know, being stewards and mm. and, and 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 leaving this earth in in a manner that uh, others can benefit from it, and in Islam itself was this idea about uh, you have a trusteeship that was given, and you you really are responsible for it. So this extends to everything. So your trusteeship duties will extend to relief of poverty if you've got wealth, to and ensuring that uh, you don't do things which damage land, environment, water, pollution, things like that. So uh, if there was um, a river, for example, that was uh, being used as a dumping ground for uh, all the toxic stuff from a paint factory and, and, and then destroying, mm -hmm. you know, contaminating it, that would be totally, totally unexpected and un un unacceptable. As, as a thing to do. So, you know, what we need now, because, because I worked in the industry with environmental issues, and, you know, if uh, there, there has to be pressure, so we put pressure mm -hmm. on companies. So look, if you want this contract, you have to abide by environmental standards. You have to make sure there is minimization of impact, restoration of land, and, 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 and to make good what you are, you know, spoiling, so to speak, in the process of this particular project. So we need that kind of pressure, uh, even at the corporate uh, profit-oriented level. That, look, you want this contract, you have to do these things. So, you know, we have this whole system of improving environmental standards, and then we get into the issue about formulating the standards, and you, you're thinking about how do you enforce it, and, you know, how do we actually, what are the remedies, etc.? What are the upfront costs that can be uh, guaranteed by cash or bonds mm. or whatever that can be given to government to ensure that if this person, if the company doesn't do what they're supposed to do, it will, it will have the resources to do it. So there are ways in which uh, we utilized uh, this, these kinds of uh, levers of power, so to speak, uh, in contracts, in legislation, by making it... Uh, you know, quite explicit, what are the legislative requirements. Mm -hmm. But clearly enforcement is, a, is an issue and uh, that we, together with enforcement, you also get corruption. So, you know, you, you get into very, yeah. very wicked problems as well, you know, in many situations. But I think we have to just keep on uh, trying, uh, using all possible ways of bringing about change, both at the market level, at the supply, supplier's level, at the community level, at the society, at the government level, in every in universities, mm. for example, like yourselves, mm. you know, thinking about bringing these things to the forefront, making the students realize that, look, mm. there is something to be considered. So don't dump your water bottles. Oh. Uh, just... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and it is surprising, actually, I think, how quickly attitudes and behaviours can change. I mean, the one that really strikes me is how quickly um, a vegan lifestyle has gone from being something that was almost unheard of and was certainly very difficult, you know, that there wasn't the, the products available, to something that is routinely, you know, institutions and uh, shops and, and restaurants and so on kind of have to take into account that some of the people eating there will expect vegan food um, and that's happened really really quickly and I think driven by by young people and and so there is that sort of argument isn't there of like a tipping point that it may seem like at the moment um, it's a very long and uphill struggle for a lot of behavior change but actually yeah. 
it doesn't take a lot for something to tip over to being this is the norm and everybody kind of then has to uh, suddenly it then becomes a lot easier because everything moves to facilitate that. Yeah. So, for example, in Middlesex, I noticed that they were selling a, a reusable cup mm -hmm. water, coffee, all these things. Uh, very nice one with the logo of the university. Yeah, we have <laughs> very similar. Yeah. And then there was a, a levy. If you if you don't use this, if you are using a, if you're using a, something else other than this, if you're using a cup, a plastic cup, styrofoam cup, or you know something like biodegradable, we'll still charge you. Oh, I see. And now your coffee is going to be more expensive. Now you've got to work it out how much it'll be better for you to actually have this thing and carry mm. it around. And it's a nice, beautiful logo of the yeah. university. So it's like identity. You know, yeah. generating you know, thing. And, and that, I think, is the thing, isn't it, when you're talking about changing behaviour in communities, that the sense of community is part of what you can leverage, if, is that the word? Yes. That sounds very American, uh, to to actually change that, that, that particularly, I mean, especially if you're thinking about a faith community, quite often a faith community wants to be a pioneer. Um, and likewise, you know, we we quite often in a, in a sort of good way make use of inter-college rivalry. So we've, we've got a bit of a competition going on between colleges at the moment with with running and, and raising money for charity. And you can kind of use that sense of pride in a particular community to yeah. uh, influence, I think, people to behave in a certain way. Um, I think we've got a question coming up. Uh, is there? Oh, just saying goodbye. Yes, I think, in fact, we probably have come to the end of uh, end of our time. So thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Um, thank you, Mike Ball, very much. And I will just stop recording. Uh, there we are.